We're talking about the uncontrollable sin. And, and when we define the uncontrollable sin, it's coveting. Coveting in the Bible is a word that describes delighting in something. It's positive or negative depending on what is delighted in or what is coveted. Coveting is not just a negative word. It's not just something that we ascribe to evil things, like wanting something evil. It's good or bad depending on what we want. Delighting in something belonging to another violates the Tenth Commandment. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or goods or servant. Um, but as we think about desires and wanting something, I think you'd agree with me that if we trace actions and the actions that we might want to change, actions begin as attitudes which begin as desires. And if we're going to get to the root of the issues that we deal with, it's too late. Actions, they're not the beginning. Attitudes aren't the beginning. Would you agree with me? It all begins with desires. And learning to manage desires is one of those things in the Bible that is a premium is put upon. When God is very invested in helping us to learn to manage desires, and this morning we're going to think about what that means. What does it mean to manage desires in a way that will allow us to have the right attitudes and will allow us to have the right actions. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, it says in James, a, wor a verse, we're going to kind of look at James chapter 1 this morning. He has some very interesting things to say about desires. Here's what it says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy. What that means, it doesn't mean be happy. It means be actually literally what it means is be led to joy. The word consider actually is a word that talks about leading someone somewhere. What does that mean? It's, so what it suggests, I want you to imagine you're in a dark tunnel and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So when you're going through the darkness, you look at the light that's at the end of the tunnel and it helps you get through the dark period. That kind of is what he's talking about. There are circumstances that the people James is writing to that are very uncomfortable. He's not telling those individuals to smile when they go through these difficult circumstances. That would not be very healthy. What he's saying to them, think about where this road is going to lead. The light at the end of the tunnel is the understanding of what they will learn, what will be developed as a result of the path that they're on. Think about the results and let the understanding of the results condition your response to difficult things right now. Difficult things are always difficult, but if we can see, okay, there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, it helps us have a different relationship with the difficult things we go through now. That's what James is saying in this passage. Consider it pure joy, because here's where the road will lead. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance literally means to remain under a circumstance. It's literal to remain under. So what it describes, when you're going through difficult things, you learn to remain under things, to stay in situations that you would like to get out of if you could, but you can't. That capacity to remain under a circumstance, to find the wherewithal to be able to stay rather than bolt, that is a non-negotiable element of spiritual maturity and spiritual usefulness. So if you find somebody who seems to be spiritually useful, they come alongside individuals and are able to comfort them. They are encouraging. They provide wisdom and perspective. Somebody who is usable, what you're going to be able to find 
is times in their life when they went under, they went through difficult things. And having gone through this difficulty, it provides something that they were able to use to be able to comfort others. I want you to think about somebody who you know who is sympathetic and encouraging. I want you to think of the person. That person that you can come to and you can kind of bring up whatever you need to bring up because you know you're not going to get judged. They're not going to point the big bony finger. They're going to listen. They're going to care. They're not going to preach at you, maybe. Do anybody you have that thought about that person? You have a, Do you have a name? Do you have a face? You got one? Do you know about this person's past? Can, do you know enough about them to understand the things that they've been through? People who have deep things to share have gone through deep things, and that's what James is saying. Uh, let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Here's what James is saying. If we are going to be useful spiritually, we'll be able to look in our past at circumstances that we had to endure. A easy path does not lead to usefulness. That's not really good news. But in another case, if you're going through difficulty now, you're not on the wrong road. You're not on the wrong path. You didn't make a wrong turn. If you want to be useful, it's going to mean that we have to learn how to manage the kind of desires that we experience when we go through difficult circumstances. How many of us really love the kind of thoughts and feelings we get when we're going through difficulties? Isn't it wonderful? You, you reach down and you, real, and, you, and you bring out all kinds of great desires, don't you? When you, when you have what you don't want and, and you're not able to do what you want to do and you, know, you, you reach down and you find happiness and joy, right? No, of course not. Resentment. Difficulty. We have a difficult time when we, when we have things we don't want to have, when we do things we don't want to do, we think things we don't want to think, we feel things we don't want to feel. You know what we end up doing? To you agree? We end up blaming somebody always, don't we? We blame ourselves or we blame somebody else. You know what it's suggesting there? Actually, some good is being accomplished in this. That's what James is saying. Um, these experiences aren't related to what they've done wrong. We end up, if you, end, if you experience something difficult, we end up saying, what did I do wrong? You know, why are you doing this? It says, um, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, temptation, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Endurance will lead to spiritual maturity and spiritual usefulness. Endurance is a non-negotiable element in spiritual maturity. So what James is saying, focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. That's what he's saying. Um, the grade is steep, but look to where the road is leading to. Temptations produce endurance. Endurance leads to being mature and complete, not lacking anything. Um, endurance provides produces youthfulness. Endurance is the ability to remain again in unpleasant circumstances. Um, Raleigh Hansen's back there, and uh, I talked with Raleigh. Raleigh was uh, one of our uh, members here who has been in the uh, armed services. He was served in Vietnam. He actually was a Navy SEAL and um, talked about this. Um, actually had a discussion with him when I, about the Navy SEAL training. Not very easy, Raleigh, was it? <laughs> Not too bad. They, tough guy. Tough guy. Uh, there was the way it works in Navy SEAL training. Uh, is uh, it's a it's a rigorous. Okay, somewhat. <laughs> See, there you go. Somewhat, somewhat rigorous. Uh, uh, it's a, a training what you go through, and if you go through the training, you're equipped to be part of a unit that is able to serve effectively. If you can't make it what they have there's a bell that you could ring this bell 
And about 80%, I've read 80% of the people who enter into the training don't get through on the other side. Only 20% make it. The, a, a number of them opt out, and the way you opt out is by ringing the bell. This is the image. The individuals James is writing to, now they're not going through physical training, but they're going through spiritual difficulties. And he's encouraging them to endure the difficult training and to resist the urge to ring the bell. Now, for Raleigh, when he went in to ring the bell would mean that he is out of the outfit and no longer in the training. By the way, I asked him if he ever, if he ever, if it ever occurred to him to try to ring the bell. And he ended up, no, it never occurred to him. Is that right? And I asked him, why is that? He goes, because of the other guys in the platoon. And we go through it together. I can't let them down, and I don't want them to let me down. And that's what he was saying. Um, in this context, uh, the image, when James is talking about, he's enc encouraging them to endure the, the difficulties that, re that they're experiencing. These Jewish Christians, they became followers of Jesus, probably in Jerusalem. And then they were forced by persecution and by famine out of Jerusalem and into the Roman Empire, which is basically Gentile territory. So when they were in then the Roman Empire for years and years, it might have been okay in the beginning, but then they really had to leave their neighborhood and they had to leave their livelihood. And so now they have been relocated in parts of the Roman Empire and they're not accepted by Jews because they're Christians. And they're not accepted by Gentiles because they're Jews. And that might have been okay in the very beginning. But over time, it became more and more difficult. Um, I can imagine you mothers then think about becoming a Christian. And because of your stand, and you want what's best spiritually for your family, you end up being relocated in part where you move away from your neighbors. And your family then, maybe it's okay at first, but then your kids start to grow up and they can't get good jobs. What's happening is some Christians then are the strain of living with these unwanted, unwelcome circumstances is getting a little bit strong. And on a spiritual perspective, they are saying, I can't do this anymore. And they're going back to the synagogue and turning from Christianity back to the place, at least in the synagogue, I can connect with friends again. I can maybe get good jobs for my kids. That's what James is writing. And for them to go back to the synagogue would be the virtual equivalent of ringing the bell. And what James is saying, hang in there. Don't give up. Don't ring the bell. Stay because you're learning things by remaining in a difficult circumstance that will benefit you and cause you to spiritually, be spiritually useful. That's what he's saying. But the temptation to ring the bell was really strong. And that's why he has to write and say to them, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own desire. It says evil desire. And I put that in there, but that's, this is the New International Version. They add evil, but the word evil is not found in the original text. I think they said they thought that it would make it clearer. But the problem isn't just evil desires. The problem is desires, and the desires aren't bad. When we learn to manage desires, we just don't learn to manage evil desires. We have to learn to manage all kinds of desires that aren't bad. And that's what James is going to talk about. It's not just evil desires, it's desires in general. Um, when by his own desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What it says, God is not the source of temptations. I imagine what was happening is this. They were in a, in a, in a world that they didn't know very well. They're living among Gentiles and they don't have maybe the kind of houses that other Gentiles have. And so they are looking over at all these nice houses going up. And they're not living in a nice house. I can see a house going up over there. And so what they're saying is, oh, thanks, God. You put that house right over there. And now I'm tempted to, to, to 
to stop what I'm doing here so I can do other things and I can make more money so I can live in a house like that. So what they're doing, God is tempting me. God put that house there. And which James is saying, that's not the way it works. It's, it might be what comes to mind, but what he says, God is not the source of temptations. Our desires are. I want to go and live in a better house. Now, is that a bad thing? No. Could it lead to ringing the bell on a spiritual perspective? Yeah, it could. So it's not bad, but it could lead to ringing the bell. How do I deal with my desire to live in a better place? That's a good question, isn't it? How do you manage desires like that? Um, first of all, what James indicates, it's not very helpful to blame God. What James is going to suggest, God is the solution. And if we see God as the problem, that leaves us without much hope because God is the solution. God isn't the problem, James says. It's our desires. We have a hard time managing our desires. I've said this before. The hardest thing I've had to learn is dealing with me when me doesn't get what me wants. You understand that? Dealing with me when me doesn't get what me wants. And we have all these things when we don't get what we want, we blame and we, some of us point the finger inside. Of course, I don't have what I want. I am, of course, I don't have what I want. Look at my mom and look at my dad. We, we either blame ourselves or blame others. Um, what it's saying, it's, it's, it's not God. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. He is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, spiritually. Death comes from sin. Sin comes from desire. Would, would you agree with me? We need to learn how to manage desires. It's on the road to usefulness. Dealing with desires allows us not to in deal with some things that we might not want to deal with. Um, it says, so first of all, God doesn't tempt anyone. He leads his children into difficulties. That's true. But the desires that drag us away from endurance, they don't come from him. They come from us. We are tempted by desires. Um, what do we do with desires? So you got these desires. I want to suggest that there's, there's three things we can do with desires. Uh, deal with two of them to begin with. We can satisfy them or we can silence them. Right? So we got a desire. I want to live in that house. I could satisfy the desire, maybe. Take a mortgage, do it. So that's one thing. And so if I satisfy the desire, I feel better. Doesn't it feel good when you satisfy desires? I want something, I get it. Ah, oh, that felt good. You know, I wanted that. I'm going to have this meal. I want to eat. It might be, it could be a number of things. Satisfy, another thing we can do is silence them. If, if we can't get what we want, if we can't do what we want, if we can't think what we want and feel what we want, another way we can deal with the tension is by silencing. Well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't want it anyway. Yeah, I, I don't really want that anyways. And sometimes we can either get what we want or try to push down the desire. That doesn't work very well, does it? Long term, you know, you can push a desire down and it tends to come up or you can satisfy a desire and then another desire comes up that, that we have to meet. It, it doesn't, it doesn't last very long. It doesn't seem, um, we can satisfy or silence them, and that's the way to eliminate the temptation. What's going to happen? If we assume that we're going to be able to satisfy and silence the desires, the problem is we're not going to learn to endure. Because enduring 
The temptation of unfulfilled desires is part of what it takes to become spiritually useful. So here's what I'm saying. In order to become spiritually useful, we have to learn to live with the temptation that comes from desires that we couldn't satisfy or silence. Let's think about Jesus. Jesus would be an example of someone who learned the lesson he needed to learn in order to be useful. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was led into the wilderness? Remember that? Remember the story? Um, he was led into the wilderness. He didn't eat for 40 days, and he became hungry. And so the devil came, and there were some temptations. The first temptation was, turn this stone into bread, and that's one thing that he was tempted to do. No, what happens when Jesus turns the stone into bread? He eats it, and the physical hunger is satisfied. That was the first temptation. Is there something wrong with eating? You're saying, no, there isn't, Mike, and if you'd keep going, you know, then we might be able to get to eat. So why don't you like get this thing rolling along? Anyway, just kidding. Um, um, there's nothing wrong with eating, but then the, the second thing the devil said, put yourself up on a wall in the city of Jerusalem and jump off, and God will catch you. And that will satisfy a desire as well. And the third thing was, and if you bow down and worship me, all the nations in the world will give you their glory, and everybody in the world will kind of follow you and look to you. Hunger creates, hunger can be physical. And what the devil is tempting Jesus with, turn this stone into bread, use your connection with God, to satisfy your physical hunger so you can get rid of it and you can get rid of the tension tension that goes along with it. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to trust God to provide what I need and I'm going to remain in physical hunger. Uh, Jesus didn't use his connection to remove his tension. So then he tried something else. Okay, tell you what, that, that doesn't work. Jump down from the wall. God will catch you, and then what will happen? Maybe emotionally you'll understand that God does care, and it will prove, you'll prove that God cares for you. It will deal with emotional tension. So if it's not physical, then make God prove it, and then you won't be emotionally doubting. Or if you don't do that, then fall down and worship me, and you'll get rid of the social hunger. You know what Jesus did? He didn't assume that his connection with God could be used to help him to get rid of his tension and to help him. It, it didn't mean that he would not have to endure. The fact is, if you are in a relationship with God and if you're going to be on the path to usefulness, sometimes you are going to feel socially disconnected. And that's a hard thing to endure. Would you agree? to feel disconnected, not as close with people as you once were, and you can't do anything to bring those people close. They are far away and you can't fix the relationship. Would you agree with me? That's a really difficult thing to endure. And as we learn, and there's a way to endure it, as we learn to endure that, it does help us to be useful. Sometimes it's not social, it's emotional. We feel all these things we don't want to feel feelings we don't want to feel, and we do anything if we could just feel something different from the thing we feel, and we can't fix it. We say, God, take this away, take this feeling away, and he doesn't. And we feel like, well, don't you care for me? And the fact is, he does. But learning to deal with social disconnection, learning to deal with emotional hunger is part of what's on the path to usefulness. Or it might not be emotional, it might be physical. Think about what Jesus did. He said, no. My father will meet my needs, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to fall down and worship. I'm not going to go to Jerusalem and jump off a wall, and I'm not going to turn this stone into bread. Because what he understood is, my father is with me. Even though I have unmet needs, he's going to meet my needs. He's going to meet my needs. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to assume that I'm going to be able to use him to get what I want. You know, that not that a hard thing? We, we, we assume that we can use God to get what we want. You get that?
All of us do it. And when we're not able to use God to get what we want, what happens? We end up blaming somebody, don't we? We end up blaming ourselves. Well, of course I don't get what I want. I don't do what God wants me to do. And we put distance between us and God. Some of us blame others. Some of us blame ourselves. If you're in a situation where you don't have what you want to have, you don't do what you want to do, you don't feel what you want to feel, and you don't think what you want to think, that's a hard place to be. Get that. You know what, though? It doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. For his children, God will lead his children in a path like that in order to allow us to be useful. That person who sympathized, the reason they could sympathize is they've been through difficult things. What difficult things have you been through that allow you to come alongside others? What do you know about? Some of you know about social disconnection. And you're able to come alongside other people who feel disconnected and you're able to comfort them. Some of you know about emotional things that are very troublesome. You know deep emotional pain and because you know emotional pain, you can comfort others who are in emotional pain or physical hunger. The path to youthfulness, usefulness involves enduring things that we don't want to endure. And I'm not saying feel great about that, but if you're in a difficult place right now, emotionally or socially, look at the light at the end of the tunnel. There's usefulness in the future because those whom God uses end up learning. I told an illustration. There's this guy who God tells him to push on a rock. So this guy, big, huge rock. And this guy pushes on the rock. And day after day after day, he pushes on this rock and it's not going anywhere. And so he finally gets to the place where he says, nuts to this. I'm not pushing on this rock anymore. This rock's not going anyplace. And he starts pushing on the rock. And then God comes to him and says, I notice you're not pushing on the rock. And he said, no. Well, why? And he says, because it's not going anywhere. And God says to him, I didn't have you push on the rock because of the rock. I didn't push. You're not pushing the rock to move the rock. I want you to look at your back and the muscles that you've developed in your back. That's why you were pushing on the rock, not to move the rock, but how it developed you. There's things that God has us go through that develop things in us. It's not just about being able to get what we want. It's about what we, what we create in us when we don't get what we want. Um, Jesus didn't just satisfy or silence his emotions. He soothed them. Here's what it says in the Bible. Let us therefore make every effort to enter God's rest, enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. There is Jesus in the wilderness, and then there's the Israelites, and that didn't go as well. They One experience of frustration after another, and they didn't make it through very well. Here's the writer says, here's the thing they didn't do. The grumbling the hard-heartedness, the disbelief, all the things that created deep spiritual issues. This is the problem, and it says it right there. Make every effort to enter that rest so that you will not fall by following their example of disobedience. You know what God would help us to do? That's what Jesus did. When we feel feelings that we don't want to feel, desires that we don't want to to have, once you listen to me, and we're just about done. Don't try to fix them right away. Don't try to satisfy them or silence them. Don't condemn them. Jesus didn't condemn his desires. Even when he didn't want to die the night before, he accepted it. So here's three things to inter in terms of entering God's rest, and then we're done. Number one, decrease condemnation. If you have thoughts or feelings that you don't like, say, you know what, I don't like this, but it doesn't mean it's bad. We have thoughts and feelings, and when we judge them, we try to push them under the water, and that doesn't work really well, does it? It's like, you know what happens when you push a beach ball under the water? It's going to come up anyways. So rather than 
force something down, stop forcing it, observe it. So you're angry, so you're upset, so you, you feel disconnected. Don't push it away. Touch it. Touch it. Decrease condemnation. God's not condemning it. it in fact, well, he doesn't want to condemn it. This is number one. Decrease condemnation. Secondly, increase awareness. Increase awareness. What are you thinking and feeling? Some of it might not be good, but don't condemn it. Admit it. Look at it. Touch it. I feel this. I feel that. Okay. Decrease condemnation. Increase awareness. And here's the third thing. And here's surprising. You know, increase expression. You know what God wants you to learn to do? You know what soothing desires means? Talk to God about them. That's what Jesus did. God's not condemning them. And as you express them, you know what, God, I'm dealing with this and that and the other. I don't like the way this feels, but will you give me strength today? Will you give me peace today? You know what that starts to do? You don't wrestle with your desires. You, are, you don't condemn them. Become aware of them. Express them. Isn't that what Jesus did? He trusted the Father enough to express and be honest with him. about. Now, he was respectful. And that's what, those are three steps. We'll continue to talk about those. Decrease condemnation, increase awareness, increase acceptance, increase expression to God. Um, let's stand for closing prayer. God, I guess the deal is that if we are your children, we're going to find ourselves in situations, circumstances that we don't want to be in. The natural temptation will be to try to satisfy or silence our desires. And if we're unable to, we're going to blame someone. We're going to blame ourselves, or we're going to blame others, or we're going to blame you. And what you tell us is that, that there is something you produce in us as we learn to remain under difficult circumstances and unwanted feelings. We learn to stick in a place long enough to connect with you in order to endure it. The fact is, you're not going to eliminate our temptation, our, our tension. You're going to help us to endure it by connecting with you. Um, teach us about that. Help us to decrease our condemnation of ourselves, increase our awareness of what we think and feel, and increase our ability to come to you and to express what it is that we need and have you give us today what we need in order to become the men and women you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, Mom.